uh, cellos and basses. And then a couple of bass guitars, piano, harp, and electronics. Um, and so you can see there that is a screenshot. Oops, sorry, moving between too many windows here. Uh, so that's a photo of the soloists uh, with surrounding the choir there, and the orchestra is positioned behind them uh, at, at the rear of the stage. And so I was the musical director for the work. Uh, so that's once again a shot of us in performance. Um, as I was saying, there's a scrim behind me so that the lighting sort of didn't interfere with what was happening on stage, uh, but had very little um, contact with the soloists just because of the way that we were set up. Um, if I go to the score, so here's, here's an image of the entire, entire score. So all of it in the score player in uh, five different parts. So six different parts, that's right, act three was split into two. So we had the overture, act one, act two, interlude, and hmm, it's an extra eye that's managed to creep in there, but that was act three, part one, and part two. If I just, hopefully I can do this without, yes, I can. So this all uh, appeared in the score player. So each of the musicians uh, within the orchestra had an iPad in front of them, and they were able to read the score in the score player. If I just find, okay, there we go. Uh, speechless. So I'll take Act One as an example. You can see this is how the score would have appeared. By default, it goes to the choir and soloist part uh, purely because when we did the workshop in Adelaide, we were projecting the part for the choir and soloists and wanted it to have a black background so there wasn't a lot of bleed. Um, in the Perth festival season, we didn't end up projecting the score for the choir and soloists. So that became you know, a huge role for the conductor. And I'll speak to that in just a little bit. Uh, I just want to check, I've got 20 minutes for this, is it? Uh, yeah, so typically 15 awesome. minutes, uh, presentation, five minutes, questions. Awesome, thanks, Jim. <laughs> just wanted to make sure I didn't talk too much. Uh, so this is the choir and soloist part. And you can see there's that initial vocal entry there. This eerie is a from nowhere part. Each of the soloists had a different color. So green, purple, uh, so this uh, mustardy yellow color and blue. Uh, and then the choir was split into four groups. Uh, and each group was kind of assigned to one of the soloists and occasionally had parts where they would at least kind of together uh, with the soloist. And you can see this is the, the choir plus soloist entry here uh, with all these tick, tick, tick sort of sounds, um, some very percussive sounds from the choir. If I scroll up on the iPad, it changes to first the score and then to each part. So you'll see this is the strings part in blue and we see the cello part is sort of full opacity here. Everything else is faded out so that players can see their part, know the context that's happening around it, but be able to clearly identify what they're supposed to be doing. You'll notice as well in the corner, there are these little colors here so that when the um, performers first choose their part, they don't have to scroll all the way in to try and find exactly you know, which one they are to find an entry. Uh, so that was just for convenience there. And Another useful thing was that we had um, lighting and stage cues in a separate layer as well. So uh, you'll see here, let's see if I can find a stage cue in this one. Ah, here we are. So standby audio one, audio one go, uh, all those sorts of things. Uh, so the, the, the backstage crew were able to, to sync directly from the score player as well. And they had an iPad uh, in front of them as well. Uh, you can, as you can see, it's in, oops, it's in multiple parts in the score player, which means that to get between them, normally you would have to go out of the score and back into it. Uh, but what we managed to do, let me just move this out of the way so I can find where I put the slides, here we are, is we had a little Raspberry Pi connected to the network, which basically controlled all of that automatically. So it would monitor where uh, the score was, once it got to the end of a section, it would automatically change the score uh, for everyone. And all the individual players would have to do would be to move from the choir part to their individual uh, part. And then I would just be able to press play and the opera would continue on as a pretty much attacker between movements. The other useful thing you can see here, it shows all the OSC messages that are being sent between the players, uh, between the iPad 
players, I should say, so that you can see if there's anything wrong with the network or anything not happening that should be happening. And this device list on the left-hand side, uh, it's white here because this is currently while the score is playing, but before the score is playing, these are all color-coded. Um, so if an iPad isn't connected, it'll show up in red. If it is connected, it'll show up in green. So it was a very easy way backstage before starting the show to be able to quickly check that everyone was connected, everything was good to go, and we could have a, a really smooth uh, performance. Uh, onto the conducting side of things. So as you can see, um, behind me there is the stage area, and there were audience on, on both sides of that stage and all the way around to the back, uh, which meant that so the soloists couldn't really see me and I couldn't really see them. So we had a camera positioned directly in front of me. You can see hopefully up in, on uh, this beam here, there are a couple of monitors for the soloists and for the choir. So they can see, it's sort of fairly, was fairly zoomed in on my face and hands so they could see exactly what I was doing and I would conduct directly into the camera when I was dealing with them. Uh, another angle from that you can see there's all the action going on to the right there on stage. And I'm the orchestra and I are just entirely behind that. So that created obviously uh, challenges, uh, particularly as more so for, for the, the choir and the soloists, because as I said, without a projection, they were doing it entirely, well, almost entirely from memory, which is a, a tricky thing when you have a score that, that isn't organized into sort of um, or as you saw, you saw the score just a second ago, it doesn't have a standard sort of sense of pulse or, or rhythm um, that we would be accustomed to. It was a very big challenge for the singers to memorize. Um, so what ended up happening is that they tended to memorize um, the contours of their parts. And then I would sort of show exactly where, um, where those lines fell and where they would have to sing. As an example of that, let me just, Right, I'll just move to this slide. So once again, you can see another shot of uh, Judith there. It's entirely uh, unable to see me apart from in the monitors. Uh, I will come back to that in just a second. So as an example of this conducting, let me just, I'm pretty sure it's this clip here. I'll just try and make sure I've got the right one. Okay, nope, that's not it. Just check clip seven. Okay, got it. So, if I just move this here. Hopefully that gives you the idea there. You can see my hands are just following the, the melodic contours of the line and prompting the soloist with where exactly they're, they're meant to be. And of course, they've already memorized the contours of this material. And this is just acting, yes, both as a memory jog and showing exactly where time-wise things are happening. And then you'll see with the other hand, there was the occasional cue, or there was that percussion cue, that bowed symbol cue that happened uh, there. Uh, about, about three minutes remaining. Wow, okay, I need to get a move on then. So uh, another, another technological thing that we, we did uh, to make things easier was that we had the iPads interface with the lighting desk as well. So there, was, there were occasionally cues which were um, taken from the lighting uh, states and they're able to send an instruction to show a cue light directly on the score in front of me, which was really, really convenient. Um, so, as I said, you can see there's all these sorts of percussive effects that happening in the choir here, often with these sort of gestures that basically showed the busyness, how busy something was at a particular time. So once again, in the choir parts, they had 
a lot more percussive sounds than the soloist. There wasn't so much in terms of um, melodic movement. And so they just had to sort of memorize, okay, tukas were the first section and then there were the shh. And so they had sort of a list of actions that they had to memorize and then cues to show where those actions fell. If I have time, I'll show an example of one of the shh gestures for that. But let me move on to the uh, talking about the instrumentalists. So even though the instrumentalists had the score directly in front of them, one thing that we found was that, you know, there's a lot of leeway in terms of where you exactly you interpret the line hitting the playhead, it's give, especially given the scroll rate. Um, when this uh, wind entry here in green was left up entirely to the players, it wasn't always entirely together. And so it was much cleaner and simpler to just give a conducting cue and have them all come in at once on what it was a fairly exposed and very soft entry. So we had a hunch that that would be the case just from a lot of years of experience with Decibel and realizing that, that for a lot of the graphic scores that we, we played, we still had to do all the sorts of normal things that you would do as chamber players. You still had to lead, you still had to follow, you still have to know when entry, entries were together and the like. And the hunch was that this would be the same case here with a larger ensemble and that a conductor would help that. So to, to check that that was the case, uh, we sent out a survey uh, to the musicians uh, afterwards and we had uh, a number respond to us, maybe sort of a third of the group, um, or maybe just slightly less actually. And generally you can see that most of the, the musicians tended to find that the, the conductor did offer something beyond the score, um, that there was that extra musical element added to it, um, that it couldn't have been rehearsed without a score, although um, potentially it could have been performed without a score. Um, so the conductor definitely undertook most of those, well, all the functions that the conductor would usually undertake in rehearsal in terms of balance, in terms of ensemble, in terms of actually shaping the work uh, as a whole uh, um, and really striving for that musicality. Um, of course, once again, this is just a survey of the musicians. So had the singers been included in this survey, I mean, I'm sure there might have been a different result. They probably would have said that it would have been impossible without a conductor. I mean, maybe with enough time, they could have learned the parts exactly to just go off the cues that they heard in the ensemble. Um, but it would have been a much harder task for them. Uh, we also had a bit of a qualitative survey for this as well. Um, so uh, it was quite, once again, when asked um, about you know, what, uh, what the conductor offered was things like the, and how the, how conducting changed compared to, to usual because of course there's no sort of beat pattern to follow. You know the focus was on attack and articulations and the visual representation of these parameters. This led to a very cohesive orchestral sound. It helps make sense of the, of the markings and had the overall context of the piece in his head, which he was able to convey to us. Uh, I feel most orchestral, orchestral musicians will listen to recordings to gauge the context of their parts. So it was helpful for the good actor to go through which parts were playing which roles. So basically looking through the, the survey results, you see the same sorts of, of things that you would see um, for any sort of standard orchestral piece. That the conductor really just helped uh, provide a human element and really helped to convey uh, the musical intent of the work uh, in a way that's maybe not quite as obvious sometimes on the score. Um, Although that's a, from the survey results, you can see that most people uh, found the score easy to understand. So it wasn't a, a lack in understanding, it was really just bringing a sort of a cohesive approach to things. Uh, which brings us, I think, towards the end, and you can see as a, just a few uh, more shots of the performance uh, with the, the soloists in their various assigned colors, colored fabrics and the choir moving around in the space through the lighting that was suspended there. Uh, and that sort of concludes, <laughs> thankfully, hopefully within the time limit, our presentation. Yeah, that's great, thank you. Um, that's a really, looks like a really wonderful production. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm happy to see those numbers and that you actually did this survey because it fits with my intuition about the, nece the necessity of a conductor, right? The, uh, technology even that predetermines the temporality of a of the performance of a piece doesn't is not a substitute for for what the conductor does I don't think and so I I wasn't surprised by your results but it was still nice to see those numbers kind of um, there so I see Jonathan has a question yes uh, well Aaron it's really fascinating uh, I really like it. 
Um, it's, it's really a general question observation. I, I just thought you, you mentioned Pulse and I was thinking just in traditional music, a conductor and in mu traditional music notation, a conductor is, is essentially a human metronome, no? So what, what's the difference with animated notation? Yeah, so once again, I guess the, the, the really it was a shift in the focus of, of what the role of conductor was. So I think, I mean, ideally in, as I've spent a lot of years as a back desk tutti player in, in a lot of orchestras, oh, uh, particularly the WA Symphony Orchestra. And in, in an ideal world, when you have a really, you know, good group of players, the role of the conductor is less human metronome and more expression and, and more, um, I guess, guiding the ensemble through changes of tempo and, and things like, and, you know, the artistic side of things rather than being, you know, obviously with a, um, a less experienced group, they absolutely are just a human metronome and basically just time cop, keeping everything together. Um, so in, in this case, it was it just it just got rid of that role entirely. I mean, the the main timing issue that it solved as it were for some of those really um, exposed entries where things had to just be precisely together, and you can just sort of give an upbeat in tempo and really place it. And I said, these are all musicians with a lot of ensemble experience and so they're able to just gauge that very precisely um, but otherwise it, it's totally just the expressive side of things and really trying to um, you're trying to shape the music and especially for I mean you could uh, if I had time to show more clips that would be, be handy but you can see that as so when I was shaping the solo for the, the vocalist it's really I mean there were moments the, the odd cues that were happening in the orchestra but whenever the the solos had stuff I really just had to, to tend to them because they had really the hardest job of, of trying to follow these contours that they'd, that they'd memorized without sort of any frame of, of reference. We got time for just a couple of quick ones. I see Gerard uh, put up his hand. Yeah, <clears throat> uh, we recently had a, a presentation by the uh, Hamburg-based um, systematic musicologist Clemens Werner who's uh, concentrated and is, is focusing on, on, on questions uh, surrounding uh, the role of the um, conductor uh, and how he, uh, how uh, the gestures of a conductor influences not just uh, the judgment of the musicians but also the judgment of the audience. And there's been a, an experiment which has been documented. I don't have the link, but I can inquire uh, on playing um, uh, um, on having uh, subjects uh, judge uh, a, a recording. Uh, where they first uh, didn't see uh, a conductor and then they heard the same recording with a conductor and they judged the uh, the you know the 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 recording more lively uh, when they actually saw a conductor doing gestures uh, along with it uh, so it's 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 just amazing how this um uh, how, how this works and uh, and um, and I suppose it's it's like uh, kind of hardwired into into our system this um, mm. this um, um, uh, um, uh, well, how shall I put it um, um, I'm lacking the word right now but this um, kind of synesthetic, synesthetic uh, mm. um, uh, perception of, of music yeah if, if you've got a link to that paper I would love to read it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, maybe maybe if you can post that in Slack or or in yes. the chat here. Um, so we're we're two minutes over, but uh, Todd, if if your question is quick, uh, take a swing in. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, very quick. I didn't catch the connection with the uh, the lighting director or the lighting operator. Uh, so between the iPads of the orchestra and the LX people, what's going on? Yeah. There? So there was a there was an LX board that could um, speak OSC basically and could send OSC messages. And so we just had it send uh, a command to the iPad. So the iPad, you can connect to them using any sort of like Macs or any other device that understands OSC um, through just a very simple handshake and then can send commands. So we, we just added a feature to the iPad where you can basically uh, connect to it from an external device and just send through a lighting queue. And so you can send through either a red red flash in the top left corner or a green flash to show stop and go signals that you wouldn't uh, have. A cue light then, it's like yeah. a cue light. Oh, okay, thank exactly. you. Thank you. Yeah, but just conveniently, you know, contained within the score. In the score, yeah, nice. 
Well, thank you so much, Aaron, and thanks for all the questions. Um, so next up, we have James Opstad and a paper called Aiding the Performance of Tempo Canon, New Technology in Studies 1, 2, and 3 for String Quartet. So I will turn it over to you, James. OK, so hopefully you can all see that OK. Um, so my name is James Opstad, and I'm a composer and double bass player. Uh, I'm currently in the final year of my PhD at the University of Birmingham where my research focuses on developing new score reading technologies and utilizing these in my compositions. So today I'm going to talk about three string quartet studies that I wrote for Apartment House and the technology that facilitated them. I'll then also demonstrate the current state of my score application and the changes that have been made since the paper was published. So these three works are examples of tempo canon. And this is a type of canon where the same material is superimposed at different speeds. As a form, it poses particular challenges to an ensemble, as each performer must maintain their own unique pulse that is nevertheless in a precise relationship to the other players. And individual performers may also be required to shift suddenly to distant tempi with a high degree of precision. So the historical precursor of the tempo canon is the prelation canon, and there are well-known examples of this from the early Renaissance by composers such as Johannes Ockeghem and Josquin de Pre. And the Misa Prelation and by Ockeghem is a particularly rigorous example. So in this slide, you can see part of the manuscript for that work. And you'll notice that one voice is written out for each canon and the menstruation marks are given alongside. So what we have here is on the left-hand side, we have voices one and two, and on the right-hand side, we have voices three and four. And this is the same, but uh, made a little bit clearer. So the menstruation marks are actually the markings next to the clefts, and they indicate the alterations of the written durations. And this is how that translates into modern notation. So it reveals now the intricate ways in which the parts overlap and intertwine. So it should be noted that the menstruation markings do not alter all the note values. And this is what distinguishes prelation canon from tempo canon. In a tempo canon, all durations are scaled by the same ratio. And the rhythmic relationships are also relatively simple in this case, which makes it possible to perform the music without any further aids. So moving now into the 20th century, tempo canon was used extensively in the music of Con and Nankara. And it's in his works for player piano, the relationships between tempi reached ever greater levels of complexity and included rational, irrational, and even transcendental numbers. So in this slide, you can see part of an Nankara piano roll, and it's quite a good um, visual representation, you can immediately kind of see, see what's going on. So a defining, a defining characteristic of this music is that it demands performance by machines. Nankara did, however, theorize about the possibility of using synchronized video conductors. So here is the relevant quote. And I've got the idea of each performer having a small television screen with something imitating a conductor that comes to the beat. So they can see it coming, whatever it is. I don't think it would be too complicated. It would probably be expensive, each one having his own screen. So nowadays, of course, it's commonplace for each performer to have their own screen in the form of a tablet computer. And throughout this conference, we've seen many examples of the innovative ways that people are exploring these possibilities um, the new possibilities that this presents. So my own music is very different in style to Nankaro's, uh, but it does share some of the same underlying principles. And my use of technology is motivated by the wish to make things easier for the performers and convey the score in a simpler, more direct manner. The way I construct these pieces is by having a global bass tempo to which all the other tempi relate. And I then use nested tuplets to scale the durations. 
So in this particular excerpt, you can see that the first violin and viola maintain a static tempo, while the second violin and cello have a controlled rallentando. And these tuplets are then hidden in the vi final score. Um, so you can see that that information is, is necessary to sort of scale things correctly, but I don't want it to be um, what the musicians are confronted with. And these unbarred pieces also use proportional spacing. So here is an excerpt from the second study where the four parts of independent tempi. And you can see that ratios are used to show the relationship of the new tempo to the base tempo. And these are translated into literal tempo markings in the app. And finally, here is an, uh, an excerpt from the third study where bar lines are used this time. Okay, so I'm now going to move on to demonstrate the app that was used for these pieces. So I'm just gonna unshare my screen and then share it again. Okay, so you can hopefully see the app as it would appear on a tablet device. So in designing this, there are a range of criteria I was sort of taking into consideration. Uh, I wanted it to function both standalone and in a networked environment. And I wanted it to be equally well suited to practice, rehearsal and performance. Um, and something else to mention is that the score and timing data are actually loaded onto the client application and all the events are then scheduled locally. So this uh, contrasts to a lot of um, other approaches where each event is communicated in real time over the network. So as you can see on this first screen, we can select from the available pieces. So I'll select study one in this case, and then you can select the available parts. So if I go to violin one, and then up in the toolbar here, you can see it now displays the piece and part that are active. There's some transport options. Here we have the synchronization status. So this will show if um, the device is in sync. And this green circle here shows the WebSocket status. So um, that will go to red if it loses connection or if the server is not available for some reason. And then you can use that as a button to then try and reconnect. Um, so actually very little data is transferred over the network. Um, it's just really transport commands and the periodic synchronization algorithm. And this makes it very robust in performance. It actually means that once the performance has started, it actually wouldn't be a problem if the network went down or even if the, um, if the server was um, uh, completely unavailable because the uh, performers would just carry on and they're unlikely to drift um, too much during the performance itself. So some performance aspects that are sort of taken into consideration, um, the player always reads from the top system and the bottom system allows the performer to look ahead in the music. So if I, I just scroll through using this um, slider, you can see that the current event is highlighted in the score and then the bottom system is just used for looking ahead. And this actually overcomes one of the sort of main drawbacks of unbarred music, which is that it's quite easy to lose your place without some sort of um, visual reference. So I'm now going to move into this window where you should see um, four separate instances of the score app. Um, so imagine these are the four separate players of the ensemble. Um, so each instance of the app functions completely independently. Um, so if I could go to file in one here, file in two, viola and cello, and each player can navigate the score independently, which is really useful in rehearsal. They're not sort of tied to what anyone else is doing. And then if they do want to move 
everyone else to the same location, they can use this snap feature. And all players have equal control. So if I was moving around down here, I wanted to move to a specific place to start in rehearsal, we can do that. So in terms of the visual metronome, um, this went through a variety of versions um, of varying degrees of complexity. Some more closely simulated the movement of a conductor and I tried different kinds of motion. But um, in the end, I reverted to something that was quite simple in comparison. And this is through experimentation, I found that it was really important. It was something that could be um, that you were aware of in peripheral vision without it having to be the main focus of attention. That had a really unambiguous start to the beat. And also that the um, speed of the beat is clearly discerned. So I'll just play the beginning of this piece in the four instances of the app so you can see how it works. Um, this is quite a, a good example because the violin one and viola remain in the same tempo. And then the violin two and cello are having that rallentando we, we saw earlier. Um, so you'll see the four parts start in sync and then gradually move, move apart. So obviously each player would only be, be seeing one, one of those screens, um, but that gives you an idea of how that works in practice. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is move on to showing you the current state of the application and some changes I've made since I worked on these pieces. Um, so in this here, I have um, a piece for piano and vibraphone loaded in. So I'll go open up the piano, the piano part. The first thing you'll notice at this time that now the beat is highlighted rather than the individual event. So I scroll through, you can see how that, that works. It's highlighting the position of the beat and the score. And in fact, even though this is a full score layout at the moment, um, you can see in this case, because it's the piano part, it's highlighting the beats in the piano part. And if I loaded the vibraphone part, even though it's the same layout, now the beat highlighting is going to work differently because it's highlighting the beats in the vibraphone part. Um, you can also now choose between layouts. So um, the vibraphone player may choose to read from the full score or from a vibraphone part. And in some situations, there may be additional layouts that are available. And all these things can be switched while while the score is progressing as well. So you could actually just switch the layout while it's proceeding. For example, if you're in a rehearsal and you want to suddenly switch to see what's going on in the full score. And there's also some additional um, options I've added in for the performer. So they can now, uh, if they click on this icon, it brings up the settings view. They can now alter the base tempo in performance in that uh, rehearsal so that um, if they want to change the overall speed, and this will then be relayed to all the other players. So that's very easy to do. Uh, you can also choose the mode between the highlighting we've seen, or you might choose to have a playhead instead of highlighting. So that's easy to switch. And then there are some additional options here, which uh, control whether the metronome is displayed and also whether this highlighting itself fades over the course of a beat. So I'll show you that in practice. So I could choose to have the, the beat itself fade as well. And then some performers may actually choose to um, just have that rather than having the other, the other blob and just be able to have that working its way through the score. Okay, so that's the state at the moment. Um, there are many things that I'm sort of planning to implement and uh, will continue to do so. Um, next thing I'm currently working on at the moment is just making it a little more app-like app by allowing the users to swipe through the score. 
and also be able to touch select um, the different beats. Um, I'll also make it so that the performers can choose the colors um, of the highlighting and those kinds of things. Um, eventually, I'd like to have the option of there also being an audible metronome, which may be useful in practice and rehearsal. Very long term goal is to have annotation, but that's going to take a lot more um, development time. And then finally, um, I would like to allow the performers themselves to um, be able to determine the way that beats are grouped. And this is particularly useful in metered music, actually, where in different time signatures, you may want to have um, a different grouping of the beats within the bar, depending on the, the tempo. And um, I'm actually currently collaborating on a version of the study number 34 uh, for String Trio by Nankero, that's going to use this application. Um, and that's an example where that'd be really useful, where the performers, different performers may choose to have the beats grouped in different ways. Um, and it's also really exciting now to be extending the use of this beyond my own music and adapting it to requirements of some slightly different, slightly different pieces. Okay, so that's it for me for the moment. I think I'll go with some questions. Thank you, James. That was a wonderful presentation. I'm, it's nice to see the uh, the the new additions to the app um, relative to what what was in the paper. That um, it looks like it's coming along nicely. The ability to um, have the the yellow box fade out in color over time communicates a tremendous amount of information about tempo. I think, which is really yep. nice. Yeah. Um, yeah, Gerard. Yeah. Thank you for this uh, interesting presentation and. Um... Uh, this opens up all sorts of possibilities. That's great. Um, I have a, just a very, very simple or stupid question. How do you actually enter music into your system? Yeah, uh, good question. <laughs> so this is something that's also changed over time. Um, so in the version that was used for the string quartet pieces, um, it was actually a very laborious program, um, process where I was exporting SVGs um, from, well, I, I was using Dorico, but it wouldn't really make much difference at that point. And then I was actually um, grouping all the actual um, note events within a, a vector, within vector graphics software. And then I had some scripts which would then um, assign uni unique identifiers to all those things and that would be used in the app. Okay, so that is quite laborious and, and error prone and all the rest of it. Um, so since then, things have moved on a bit. And um, I was actually, uh, I've, I was lucky to kind of, I've worked with the Dorico team a bit on some other, other work with them, which has um, given me a bit of insight into things, how, how things work there. And I, I can currently get some, I can get uh, data out of the program which isn't isn't publicly available at the moment, but I, I very much hope that one day it would be, which would make this whole process um, a lot easier. And in terms of the timing data, I also have some other programs that I've written, which make the whole process of actually um, uh, writing, or sort of composing and then creating the data for polytemporal music a lot more straightforward. So at the moment, there's kind of this layout data, which is in terms of those sort of spacing columns of where the notes are in the score, um, which is then sort of cross reference with my own time data, and that's what gets into the app. Obviously, I would like to make this all a lot more accessible to people other than myself to use eventually. Um, so it's definitely a process of, of working with um, notation softwares to try and get some of the semantic data that lives within the program to be available outside the program. And I think it would definitely be possible to implement that in Lily Pond as well. So I think that's something I'll, I'll start looking at. Nice. Well, thank you again. I think uh, we're going to have to wrap up. It's appropriate that I would be mismanaging the time in the session on time. Um, so we should move on to the next and final presenter of the entire conference. Um, I see that there is one more question um, in the chat. And I, I would maybe just ask you to answer the question in the chat uh, or in Slack or whatever, if you don't mind. Um, so thank you very much, James. I uh, appreciate it. It's a very nice presentation. Thank you. And uh, Daniela, are you ready to go? Sure. Thank you. Great. So we have our final presentation. Is Can I oh. just share? Hello, everyone. I, I'm Daniela Gizzi. I'm, I'm speaking about a 
um, a paper I've written with the two colleagues, Andre Agostin and uh, Eric Maestri, who are not here today, so I'm presenting this alone. Um, it's about time shaping practices, uh, specifically within the context of computer aided composition. So Bach and KG, you will see there are some, um, let's say, uh, common points with the presentation just uh, before James's presentation um, on the way. First of all, um, what do I mean when I speak about time shaping? I mean, it, it's, I mean, a very general class of processes, any processes, any practice of transformation of some pre-existing musical material by reorganizing its time, uh, its time uh, shape. So anything from put something on a rubber band and stretch it out or reverse it or mishmash it or but anything that changes the nature of the flow of time. And uh, the pre-existing material could be anything again. It could be one, it could be a piece of music by Bach, or it could be a piece of music by uh, someone else, or it could just be a cell, a note, uh, which then becomes a structure for something else. So it's kind of a general uh, idea. Um, and uh, I think there are three paradigms that can refer to this um, process. Let, let's say that can embody this, uh, um, um, this idea of time shaping in a sort of arch archetypal way. The first one is di dilation. We've just seen it with tempo canon somehow. So let's take something, let's stretch it out and either expand it or compress it. And the second one, well, I'll, 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 I'll look to the last one. The, the third one uh, is repetition because it's easier than the second one. So we'll just take something and repeat it. And the third one, which is in the middle in the slide is a, um, a distortion. So let's take something and let's change its nature internally without changing, let's say, uh, the overall duration. These three ideas uh, represents, uh, well, can identify a space. It's not a formal space in the sense that there are no parameters, uh, there's no value exactly on the axis and so on, but it's a sort of a, uh, informal represent representational 3D space where we can perhaps um, uh, put some practices uh, in uh, some on some points, at least generally speaking. Again, this is not a real uh, X, Y, Z uh, axis. It's a X, Y, Z axis that is used informally to talk about properties of uh, practices. And so in this, uh, in, uh, in this, uh, space, we can put any looping practice on the axis of repetition, like uh, uh, repeating something over and over. We can put, of course, some augmentation canon or retrogradation on the dilation side. Retrogradation is just a stretch of minus one. Um, we can put quantization as a sort of distortion, which it is to, to, to a large extent, as a, even, if, even though it's kind of small usually. And most practices, of course, most time shaping practices uh, do not refer to one of the axes alone, but kind of involve massive multiple axes. And so they belong to this sort of space, like uh, uh, speeding up a sound involves a change in its uh, duration, uh, but also some sort of internal distortion. Speeding up a sound uh, can be transferred, like uh, speeding up a vinyl. I will make a, an example of a symbolic counterpart of it but you can think about the same thing. So I have a score and I want to speed it up exactly as I speed up a violin. So this involves partly a dilation and partly a distortion. Um, if I take one cell and try to distort it over and over by um, interpolating it, by morphing it to some, something else, I'm working in the, um, uh, let's say, in the intersection between repetition and distortion. So I'm somewhere on this plane and so on. Uh, the other example I would give you at the end is uh, uh, Risse Accelerandi, so Risse Rhythms. These involves both repetition and dilation and distortion. So this is a, something that involves uh, multiple axes of the space. Um, in CAGE, we have, um, in the CAGE library, which is a, a computer-aided composition library built upon Bach, which is another computer-aided composition library. I'd say it's the forefather of a a uh, family of libraries uh, I and, uh, and Andrea have uh, been uh, developing since um, uh, 2010. Uh, CAGE is uh, designed to contain ready-made modules to tackle um, uh, common problems in computer-aided composition. So 
I think it kind of uh, fit to, um, well, it, it seemed fit to us to include in CAGE uh, time, time shaping modules. So something that could help composers deal with the time practices on an um, existing score. So modify some score to make something else out of it by warping time, dilating time, um, and so on, as I said. So the, the same axis we, we saw before um, involve now some cage models like dilation is performed by cage time stretch, repetition is cage repeat usually or cage looper, but cage looper also involves some distortion. So it's somewhere here. Um, quant bike quantize takes care of quantization, but it's a sort of side note somehow. It's not the main topic. Although quantization, of course, is a time shaping practice, it's not probably the most paradigm, it's not the way it is usually seen, I would say. Cage time warp is a general module that does not perform repetition, but perform any distortion and dilation. Uh, rhythm interp, on the other hand, perform some, perform some kind of uh, repetition and distortion, in, in particular morphing between one cell and another. And cage agogics is a higher level tool to, um, to deal with acceler and uh, I'll give you some examples uh, uh, in a bit more detail. Well, uh, some are straightforward. Uh, cage repeat just repeats the score over and over, like 10 times or seven times, or whatever number of times you, you want to repeat the score. Uh, all the modules in cage both work on, a menstru uh, on traditional metered scores uh, and on proportionally notated ones. So um, they're both accepted as input and given as output. Cage looper is the sort of repeat that also accepts some sort of modification. It's a strictly speaking um, lambda function because um, Cage and Bach uh, uh, operates within max, which you are seeing right now on the slide. And max is C-based and um, there, there's there's no there's no concept of a function as be something that you could uh, transfer for, from one object to another in Max, but there's a way of getting around it, which is encapsulate whatever you want to do with the data and modify, encapsulate the modification in a patch and use it in sort of a, a loopback scenario, which we call a, um, lambda loop. Uh, so uh, data is sent out from lambda outlets modified and then received in lambda inlets. So this patch is some sort of, represents a sort of lambda function in a larger sense of the word and not in a strictly speaking, not in a strict um, computer science um, thing. So in this case, you see that it's not just the middle portion here that's looped, it's looped, but, but also it gets slower and lower. So it's a sort of a getting lower and lower and lower and longer and longer and longer. So it's a, looper that also performs some modification on the elements. Um, since we were inside Nankaro uh, before, it makes sense for me to speak also about a Nankarawian example. Um, time stretch, again, is a, as I said, time stretch is a module that just takes a score, whatever score in proportional or traditional notation and stretches the proportions. Uh, the stretch should be given as a, a rational number if we get if we want to have a origin a, a traditional score for a proportionally notated score whatever number a floating point one uh, will do. Um, there are more intricacies. I'm not entering into them. It also handles meters in some sense. Uh, this is the gist of it. So you can just perform a um, stretch a constant stretch of the whole score by a, a rational factor or um, irrational as well if you use a, a proportionally notated scores. So, for instance, if we take the uh, first study of for player piano, uh, the first canon for player piano in uh, study number thirty-seven, well, it's a temporal canon again. But let's let let's suppose we could we want to do it in. A, um, uh, same tempo fashion. So, so let's see it in a sort of a, a transcribed form where tempi become dilation of the content. So we can think about every voice being dilated by a factor. These factors are, um, well, for Nankaro, these factors are the tuning of a, um, a chromatic scale. Uh, and so we can collect all of them. We, we can stretch all of them, transpose them by a fifth, 
each one of them, then collect them and combine the voices. So this is what we get. Uh, this is the gist of the usage of the cage modules. They are designed to be used in combination to one another and in combination with back modules. And they usually, by, usually by combining two or three modules, one is able to accomplish some standard, nine, I would say 20, 20th century operation on musical data or uh, more or less standard 20th century computer-aided composition operation. Uh, as far as morphing is concerned, um, the process CAGE uses to um, morph temporary information is a, a standard rhythm interpolation. So you can have different cells and navigate uh, between them by uh, using uh, weights, essentially. Uh, the only, perhaps, uh, the only non-standard thing is the fact that uh, when you navigate between cells with different number of uh, events, events are created. So, uh, well, you, you, can, you can handle this by an attribute, but I think it's uh, the nicest way to me, at least, is when uh, events double, and so they merge with uh, other events uh, um, of, the, uh, of, of the final cell. For instance, I'm starting from a four, node cell and I'm going to a three node cell. So at when, when, sorry, I'm taking. So as I go along, some events are created. And when I get to the end, it's three events. So it, it kind of uh, avoids the um, least common multiple uh, aspect of being able to deal with four and three things uh, and more between them. Uh, again, nothing fancy, but I think it's practical somehow. Um, the most general ele element we can use in CAGE for performing dilation and distortion is called time warp, CAGE.timewarp, and it operates in two fashions. The first one is by providing a temporal um, transfer function. So we, if the function is like this, nothing happens because the, the input time is on the x-axis and the output time is on the y-axis. So everything is, stays the same. This function is the normalized because I've used at, at normalized one, but it cannot be, it can be not normalized as well. But as I start to operate on the function, things may happen that change the temporality of the score. So I can go back and forth or do crazy things, whatever you want to do in, a, in your uh, specific scenario. So this is the transfer function, but it can also be um, framed in terms of uh, velocity or speed. So instead of having a transfer function for position in time, we can have a speed function. So if, if it's constantly one, it's going to be the same uh, speed all uh, as the original one. As I mount with my curve, it's going to accelerate. As I go down, it's going to decelerate. So in the end, we get something like this. Again, cage decades of time warp performs the dilation and distortion at once. Uh, if we, uh, the most higher level uh, elements in the cage library, I would say is cage.agogics. Cage.agogics allows to frame the, the question, can I write an accelerando of items uh, by using higher level uh, principles, like a number of repetition of a cell, output duration and ending speed. So suppose we start at speed equal to one, a nominal speed, and we want to get to speed equal to 0 0.5. So we want an ralentando. Then suppose we want 10 repetition of the cell. The point is we can only define two of the three attributes because the third one is inferred from the other one. So we have to set the second one to known. And what we get is 10 repetition of the cell and the ending one is half the speed of the first one at the end is half the speed. So it takes care of handling the mathematics of it. Uh, so integ integrating uh, and uh, performing all the lower level stuff that needs to make sure that this is actually what I want. And, and that's the same thing we can say, we don't care about the ending speed, but we want the accelerando to be 50 seconds or ralentando, sorry, in this case. So same thing, 50 seconds. So we, we are gonna have a something in 50 seconds within some appro approximation that can be also tailored with a um, fine tuning attributes. Um, I will give you two very quick examples because I'm late, I know, uh, but the first one is reset readings. Those are more complex examples, but somehow follow the same pr principle of the 
non-carrying canon, I, uh, I would say. So you have cage modules that take care of specific things, cage time warp, cage volume, cage repeat. So uh, in some time shaping volume uh, practices and as long as other kind of common CAC practices. And in this case, you have higher level parameters to define uh, an initial cell that gets, uh, well, perhaps eight is a bit too much, um, that gets repeated and repeated in a reset like fashion. So we can have a eternal accelerando or run in tandem um, in a symbolic fashion. Or um, the last example I will I'll give you is the one I talked about at the beginning, the sort of vinyl like speed up of scores where you have a score, but you wanted to, to have a sort of ease in, which is also a sort of a uh, accelerando and perhaps why not also a glissando like in the common variable rate uh, effect. And uh, this is also doable with a combination of uh, cage modules that uh, performs that perform a standard uh, uh, operation like time warp, as we said, uh, crop and uh, other ones join that puts things together. So we have a, a final score that resembles a sort of wow. I think that sums it up a little bit. I don't want to be longer than this. I'm, I've already been too long, perhaps. So thank you for listening and sorry for being Hey, that was that was great. Thank you so much, Daniela. It's really nice to see that material, and it was a it was, the paper is a real is a pleasure to read. It was a real invitation to think about um, this family of transformations, and it got me thinking about um, you know the inverse of some of these trans transformations. So, for example, repetition is interesting, um, but at some point, once you get to a particular uh, score where you've maybe moved some degrees of transformation away from the, what those original repetitions were, you need to kind of think about what it would mean to revert back to, to remove material and how you then kind of think about segmenting material. So there was a lot to think about that I thought was really stimulating and interesting. Thank you, it's, uh, you're right. I, I, had not, I hadn't thought of it, honestly, but it's, um, it's, it, it's definitely one thing to think about. Uh, I mean, how one way or two ways are the transformation and yeah. how we can get back to the original ones if we can. Yes, right.